Welcome to worship, uh, usually at Mill City Presbyterian Church, but not today. Uh, this is a most unusual Sunday, and I know that you are aware of what our community has been going through for the last 10 days. And so we are not in our usual worship space. Our town is still closed, although the church is safe. We're here at Albany United Methodist Church, and Pastor Laura kidner Meisen has welcomed us, and we thank her and the Albany folks for allowing us to have our worship service in their sanctuary. Uh, Curtis Hansen is our lay reader today, and will be reading from Psalm 77. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 10. As always, our bulletin is available uh, to download on our Facebook page if you would like to do that. And that way you can join us in our prayer of confession. A thank you to Curtis for being our lay reader, to Ruth, as always, for our music, and Stephen for the videography. And a special thank you to Eric McCurdy for helping us today with the logistics of sound. And uh, Eric, we're so grateful for the help that you've given us. And uh, we have no idea whether uh, we'll be able to uh, return to our own sanctuary by next week. Um, but uh, of course, we, I will get to that, but we of course ask prayers for everyone involved with the fires. But let us begin this morning with an opening prayer. Let us pray. Lord, who lifts us up, Reside in our hearts today. Help us to listen closely for your word. Remind us that you are always with us throughout all of our lives, no matter what the challenge might be. Give us confidence in your presence so that we may witness to your love through our works and our deeds. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Our prelude today is The Steadfast Love of the Lord and Great is Thy Faithfulness. And Ruth will be playing that for us now. Thank you. 
Would you please join me in this morning's prayer of confession? Lord, we acknowledge that you are here, that you never left us even when all around us seem to be falling apart. We are overcome by grief as we see the images of tragedy, as we hear the cries for help and feel the pain of others suffering. Give ear, O Lord, to the cries from our hearts and bring joy to sorrow, healing to pain. We come for rest from the weariness of shock. We come seeking your guiding hand in how we can respond. We come for your merciful healing. Be with us in darkness and in light. Amen. It is at this time that we share our celebrations and concerns. And I appreciate the number of people that sent them to me. And I encourage you every week, if there are matters of the heart that you would like prayers for, please send them in and we'll add them to our list. Today, of course, we are lifting up all of the people that have been affected by the terrible fires in the past 10 days. We pray for all of the firefighters, the National Guard, Forest Service personnel, and all the volunteers fighting the wildfires in Oregon and the other Western states. We lift up the many people who are now homeless due to those fires, and we add our prayers for all the people who opened their homes and took in family and friends and sometimes total strangers in order to provide shelter. We remember the people of our San Diego Valley communities who suffered such great loss. And we celebrate all of the organizations that have quickly sprung up to be able to distribute food and clothing and all of the needs that people have when truly their homes have burned and they have been reduced to a situation in which they have no possessions left. That, of course, is on our hearts, but there are even more concerns. Um, as vast as the fires are on the West Coast, we also lift up and pray for all of those affected by the hurricane and the flooding, especially in Florida and in Alabama. As the COVID epidemic rages on, we lift up the victims and all the families who continue to grieve the loss of a loved one. Another concern that we share together is that we remember and pray for the family of Anita Leach as they grieve her passing. A loss not only to the family, but a great loss to the community as well. We lift up John Scher, who was seriously injured on Monday as his Lynn County road crew was clearing hazardous trees near gates. We pray for his healing, and we also include in our prayers for his family as well, his wife Debbie and his children, Mike and Amanda. And we continue to keep Sandy and Robin, James and Terry, and Gloria in our prayers as we pray for their healing as well as for their strength. At this time, we will take a moment for silent prayer that you might carry your own joys, your concerns to God. So let us pray. How can we be an expression of your love, O oh Lord? How can we be your hands? Give us strength and courage to do what pleases you, 
that we can put your love in action by word and deed and make your presence known. Loving God, healer, restorer, and source of all hope, remove from us those things that prevent your love from flowing through us. May we make a difference in someone's life that they may come to know your redeeming love and put their trust in you. We pray that those in great need will be guided to services that will help them restore their lives after the many, many losses due to the fires. We ask your comfort for all who are feeling unmoored by being displaced both in home and in spirit by those fires. We remember those who are recovering from medical treatments, and we pray for those who are facing treatments in the coming week. We pray for our shut-ins, those dealing with long-term illnesses, those who in the dead of night had to flee their homes and now are basically displaced in so many places around the state. We pray for them. We miss our friends and our family that we are separated from. We pray for all those who are traveling, those who are changing routes because they cannot drive on roads that are now hazardous. As we move into the middle of September, we pray for our students and parents and in schools as they continue to determine the best way to provide education for all individuals as the school year begins, albeit in a haltering, faltering fashion. We lift up and pray for those who are hungry, those in need of shelter, and all those seeking employment. May our leaders be mindful that their responsibility lies in providing for the needs of those who are the most vulnerable among us. We lift up our troops serving around the world. We pray for them, we pray for their safety, and we are so grateful for their day-by-day -day service. And we lift up their families and their friends and pray for their comfort as they await the return of their loved ones. And finally, it is in Jesus' name that we offer the prayer that our Lord taught us when he walked among us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Old Testament scripture is from Psalm 77. I'll be reading verses 1 through 6 and 11 through 15. A Psalm of Asaph. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God that he may hear me. In the day of my trouble I seek the Lord. In the night my hand is stretched out without wearying, my soul refuses to be comforted. I think of God and I moan. I meditate and my spirit faints. Thou dost hold my eyelids from closing. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old. I remember the years long ago. I commune with my heart in the night. I meditate and search my spirit. And beginning verse 11. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. Yea, I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate on all thy work and muse on thy mighty deeds. Thy way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? 
Thou art the God who workest wonders, who has manifested thy might among the peoples. Thou didst with thy arm redeem thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The New Testament lesson today is from the Gospel of Luke, and I will be reading from chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, a story that I think you will find to be quite familiar. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side as well. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? asked Jesus. The lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. It is appropriate today that our service is being recorded in a church other than our own. As of this moment, our homeland, our community, that which is part of our hearts is denied us. Like the Jews who, having begged God to allow them to return to their homeland, found that once they returned, it was not the same. And some chose not to return at all. That realization is dawning on us. For thousands of years, people have suffered from the ravages of nature. Suffering caused by tornadoes, cyclones, tsunamis, floods, fires. Many of these disasters often set in motion directly or indirectly by human activity. There is a quaint term in the insurance industry that refers to these events as acts of God, defined legally as a natural catastrophe which no one can prevent, such as an earthquake, tidal wave, or wildfire. The theology, which I don't ascribe to, suggests that it is God who wills those disasters, wills them to happen, or at least allows them. Many insurance policies don't cover damage caused by these acts of God. Perhaps acts of nature would be a better term. Long before I became a churchgoer and a Christian, I rejected the idea that God punishes people with cataclysmic events. The idea that fires and earthquakes, floods and hurricanes, are somehow divinely inspired to punish humans seem very wrong. This is not to deny that a great deal of suffering comes from these events, for we are surrounded 
by suffering in our Sanyam communities. Human beings have spent centuries trying to find cause and effect, patterns for every good and every evil. Yet, we can each tell stories of terrible tragedies that happen to good and faithful people. We have seen them in the past 10 days. One house burned to the ground and the one next door unharmed. As humans, we want to make sense of things that make no sense. And whether we blame God or climate change or bad luck on our part, it will not change the outcome. You can do everything right and still be harmed. Goodness is no protection from pain. We know about this. We have experienced it. Innocent suffering is the great challenge to our faith. And when it happens, and it does to all of us sooner or later, it feels like the sun has stopped shining. We feel empty. We ask why, why is this happening to me? We see suffering verified on Facebook, on television, in the newspapers. Our communities are shattered. Many families have been left without a change of clothing. We have been displaced from all we hold dear. And we thought the COVID virus was the worst we had to contend with this year. So the question we ask is, can we find God in this horrific situation? And we know the answer, and the answer is yes. God has been with us every step of the way, even in the midst of our suffering, not because God is causing it, but because now we see how in our suffering we are made caring, how more open we are to one another. We live out Christ's commandment that we are our brother and sister's keeper. We are their rescuer, their feeder of cattle, the guardian of their homes. I don't know about you, but I feel as though tears have been pouring down my face for 10 days. How many stories could we tell? How many stories have we heard? The fireman who knew his own house was burning and stayed to fight the fire that was enveloping homes in the neighborhood. The girl who guided horses out of a burning pasture and turned them loose to give them a chance of survival. The people who went to extraordinary lengths to make sure that elderly folks were moved from their homes to a safe location. It is my great hope that when we have survived this disaster, someone will sit down with people and record their memories. And they can share their extraordinary stories of all the good Samaritans that helped them and all the times they played the part of the good Samaritan. The Bible text that I read, the story of the Samaritan, is well known, even to people who have never opened a Bible. And one of the things that I love about this story is that help comes from the most unlikely source. Jesus' audience would have been shocked by the fact that a Samaritan, a bystander, was the one who provided life-saving help to the injured man. He provided help to someone he did not know and would probably never cross paths with again. And yet, as we pick up the pieces of our lives, we are beginning to hear just such stories. Stories of extraordinary kindness, of courage, of selfless sacrifice. People who lost everything and now are helping gather, gathering food and clothing for others. Offering encouragement in a spirit of grace. And now, some of us who did not lose our homes are also struggling. It is difficult to know what to say to those who have lost everything. 
So let me offer some words from someone much wiser than myself. And he offers us gentle advice on how to treat someone who has suffered great loss, as so many have. In a helpful book called Lament for a Son, Nicholas Wolterstorff wrote about the death of his own son. In his book, he asks the question many of us ask, what should you say to someone who is suffering? Your words don't have to be wise, he wrote. The heart that speaks is heard more than the words spoken. And if you can't think of anything to say, just say, I don't know what to say, but I want you to know I am with you in your grief. What I really needed, Walter Storff said, was to hear that you were with me. To comfort me, you have to come close. Come sit beside me on my bench and mourn with me. That is what our faith believes happens in Jesus Christ. God has come to sit beside us, to walk with us, live with us, love with us, suffer with us, and die with us. Near the end of his book, Walter Storff wrote, We're in this together, God and me. And we are as well. We're all in this together. We are in the Good Friday stage of our suffering. But all Christians know that the amazing truth is that Christ escapes the tomb and his glory is unleashed upon a grieving world. Those helping hands of Jesus have not died with him in the tomb. In fact, those helping hands of Jesus may be right at the end of your wrists. It may be like the psalmist says in Psalm 30, weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As dark as our lives have been in smoke and sorrow, we know that joy will come, maybe not today or tomorrow, but it will come. I want to share with you a story told about a distinguished man, the only white person buried in a Georgia cemetery reserved exclusively for blacks. He had lost his mother when he was just a baby. His father, who never married again, hired a black woman named Mandy to help raise his son. She was a Christian and took her task very seriously. Seldom has a motherless boy received such warm-hearted attention. One of his earliest memories was of Mandy bending tenderly over him in his upstairs room each day and softly saying, Wake up! God's morning is come. As the years passed, this devoted woman continued to serve as his surrogate mother. The young man went away to college, but when he would come home on holidays and in the summer, she would still climb the stairs and call him in the same loving way. One day after he had become a successful statesman, the sad message came, Mandy is dead. Can you attend her funeral? As he stood by her grave in the cemetery, he turned to his friends and said, If I die before Jesus comes, I want to be buried here beside Mandy. I like to think that on Resurrection Day, she'll speak to me again and say, Wake up, my boy. God's morning is come. God's in invitation to us is to trust that all shall be well. God's morning will come, for we know that with the help of Christ, we can overcome misfortune, we can take the next step, and we can piece our lives and our communities back together. Not a return to what we had, but a brave new venture that carries us forward to do God's work in a new way. And the great consolation is, that Christ will walk with us every step of the way. Amen. 
And now, the benediction. Go into the world where strife and suffering prevail and carry God's love to every person, not counting the cost, but rejoicing in the sharing of God's peace. Amen. And for our postlude, Ruth will play Trust and Obey, and If My People Will Pray. <laughs> 